in the fifth century, one man brought terror and destruction to millions across Europe. Attila the Hun and his bloodthirsty barbarians tortured, raped and murdered all who stood in their way. According to legend, they dipped their arrows in the juice of boiled embryos, drank women's blood and were descended from unclean spirits. Attila's ruthlessness knew no bounds. He slaughtered deserters and murdered his own brother. His savage Huns struck fear into the mighty Roman Empire with their brutality. They razed great cities to the ground and massacred whole populations in pursuit of gold. Christians believed he'd been sent from hell to punish sinners. Attila became known as the scourge of God. He's different from anyone else. He is more ferocious than anyone else. He is more efficient than anyone else. He frightens everybody. From the day he was born, in 406 AD, much was expected of Attila. He would have grown up as a member of a large extended royal family, knowing uh, that he was going to have to compete for power. The stakes were very high because if he lost, he'd probably be dead. Despite his privileged position, Attila experienced terror at a very young age. One tradition that we're told about the Huns is that the male babies, when they were born, had their cheeks slashed so that they learnt to bear pain at a very early age. Like all Hunnic males, he was encouraged to ride before he could walk. They're virtually born in the saddle, they eat in the saddle, uh, they converse um, and they hold diplomatic talks whilst in the saddle. Um, this is exaggerated, of course, by the uh, ancient sources which say, get a hun off a horse and he can't walk. Attila's people were feared for their violent plundering. They descended from Mongolia, travelled west and settled in Pannonia, on the Danube, where Budapest now stands. 5th century Europe was dominated by the mighty Roman Empire. Their relationship with the savage Huns was very fragile. By the time the Huns are situated on the Great Hungarian Plain, they are in part parasitic already on the Roman Empire in a rather different way, in the sense that they're extracting cash. Sometimes they're doing this through annual tributes levied from the Romans. Sometimes they're getting it by serving as mercenaries in Roman armies. Attila grew up in a violent, merciless society where only the strong survived. The Huns were in a constant state of warfare with other tribes. Uh, there are constant tense tensions within the royal house as well. Uh, so uh, his upbringing would have been pretty insecure. He probably would have been given his own group of warriors to lead at a very early age, um, probably in his teens, mid-teens to judge by other examples whether he's really there to command or to be symbolic at that point, I think, is very debatable. But certainly his job at that point would have been to stand at the front uh, and uh, inspire courage in his warriors and also learn to face up to battle himself. His fearless leadership was rewarded with political power. Sometime between 435, 440, um, we have um, the name of Attila uh, popping up um, with his brother Bleda. Um, and for a period, the two of them run this uh, Hunnic group together. This arrangement infuriated the power-hungry Attila. But Bleda had strong support, and for now, he had to bide his time. During his 20s and 30s, Attila led a series of murderous incursions into Roman territory. The image of the barbarian, particularly the steppe nomad barbarian, is always a bad one. And they're very, very dangerous militarily, and they're very frightening. And then you've got a whole society that turns up with all its warrior males on horseback. Um, this is terrifying. The Huns were known for their deadly lightning attacks. They can cover a huge amount of ground. 
They can raid deep into provinces that are unprotected or, or only protected on the frontiers. And this is a ter terrible shockwave of fear right the way through Central Europe, because you never knew when these people were going to turn up on your doorstep. The Hunnic method of warfare is based on using the bow, uh, and Attila is associated with the Hunnic bow. They could fire arrows standing up on horseback and kill a man at 150 meters. A Hunnic attack was the medieval equivalent of the Blitzkrieg. The Huns were able, therefore, to stand outside the range of most of their enemies, shower them with arrows, make them rush at them, and the sources refer to the fact that the Huns always pretended to run away at that point, then once the opponents had lost their coherence uh, and cohesion, the Huns would then turn around and pick them off a few at a time. Alongside his devastating military capability, Attila created a network of informants along the Danube. Most of his great victories come when the Romans are otherwise engaged, there's clearly a grapevine which operates along the frontier. So he knows, for instance, in his first great campaign in 441, that the main Danubian army has been shipped to Sicily to try and recapture North Africa from the Vandals. And that offers him the opportunity to attack, and his victories then make his name. He recognized the value of a fearsome reputation. He uses his methods uh, of terror to frighten people. Now, the way to do this is by sacking cities. Uh, early on, uh, he approaches the city of Naisus uh, on the Danube, and they force their way into the city, uh, and the city uh, is sacked. And a few years later, a group of Romans are traveling along, and they have to stop short of the river uh, because it is full of the bones of the slain. For Attila's savage army, life was cheap. The Huns had no regard for anyone else's human rights. Now, we have uh, quite a few records of what supposedly is, uh, represents the, the comments of Hunnic leaders about Romans or about other people. Uh, and in fact, it's very common amongst these nomads. They basically have uh, two categories. They have themselves as masters and everybody else as slaves and slaves are entirely dispensable. Uh, so you're either dominant in this world or you're dominated, and if you're dominated, then you're completely expendable. They would inflict maximum casualties without any respect for human life at all, and that is a, a characteristic of the terrorist. Although he tasted victory abroad, at home, Attila was losing patience with his brother and craved absolute power. For many years, Attila and Blader did cooperate as leaders either of different factions of the Huns or as joint leaders of the whole lot. Um, but Attila was the kind of man who had to rule alone. Um, and in the end, it was going to be either Blader or him. Attila had his brother Blader murdered in his sleep. At the age of 40, he became sole leader of the Huns. His priority was to expand the Hunnic war machine. Knowing how effective a combined barbarian fighting force would be against the Romans, he brought together various tribal groups. His early years as king were spent consolidating the coalition with the Ostrogoths and the Gepids and the other subject tribes. Once that was done, uh, he could start on his career of terrorizing cities. Once he had political control over the Huns, the heavily superstitious Attila sought spiritual guidance. Attila would have been brought up with the Huns' own myths about uh, their mission in life. Their success was due to divine guidance. There was one key moment when a sign from God was built into Attila's charismatic image and that's when a rusty old sword was found uh, and brought to him. Attila is said to have declared at this point that the gift of the sword to him from the gods showed that he was destined to conquer. Attila is overjoyed. This is the sword of Mars. This guarantees him victory. And of course, he tells everybody about it. He wants fame. Uh, he wants glory. He wants people to be impressed. And while this is a means to an end, 
uh, to uh, get more power, uh, to get more money. Uh, it is also an end in itself uh, because honour, glory, uh, reputation are things that every great leader wants. Attila now controlled the united barbarian tribes and had the gods on his side. He was primed to attack the superpower of the Roman Empire. Attila, king of the Huns, had half a million bloodthirsty barbarian warriors at his disposal. He began launching plunder attacks deep into the Eastern Roman Empire. In 446, his armies swept across the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. They pillaged churches, desecrated the graves of saints, and slaughtered civilians. Attila enjoyed these apocalyptic scenes. He would roll his eyes in delight at the terror he inspired. He conquered more than a hundred cities. There was so much loss of life that no one could count the dead. But his motive for this genocide wasn't territorial. The leadership of the Huns relied on successful plundering expeditions. Uh, if they failed to uh, draw in wealth from outside, uh, then they failed as leaders and they were liable to be overthrown. He also used the threat of violence to extort money from the Romans. Attila was a successful war leader. Uh, somebody who could force the Romans into handing over an increasing amount of gold every year. We're talking about uh, subsidies to Attila which are thrashed out by treaties. 350 pounds of gold per year, which is doubled to 700, which is in a third treaty tripled to 2,100 pounds of gold a year. And that is just to keep the Huns off the back of the Romans and to keep the Huns sweet as far as these treaties are concerned. So what this means is Attila is the channel through which this gold is getting into the system of these Hunnic groups. Attila cunningly used these treaties to frighten his own people. Attila's cruelty towards the disloyal was his insistence that deserters should be handed back. This is a regular feature of the treaties that he makes with the Romans. And when the deserters are handed back, they are not reinstated into the Hunnic army. They are executed to discourage the rest. This, this policy meant that there was no point in deserting because you might get safely away. On the other hand, Attila would come after you, he'd frighten the Romans, he'd make a treaty, and he'd get you back, and he'd execute you horribly once he'd got you. Attila was a polygamist, which caused great jealousy between his wives. One disgruntled spouse, Gudrun, was so angry with Attila that she tricked him into eating two of his sons. This deception only added to his grotesque reputation, which by now had spread far and wide. Early Christian writers are, of course, universally um, appalled by the Hunts. Um, he, he, he gets all sorts of titles, like Flagellum Dei, you know, the, the scourge of God. Attila's image is playing in two directions. It's playing to the Romans. Uh, he basically, what the Hunnic Empire does is run a large protection racket against the Roman state, so demanding money with menaces. At the same time, he also has this multi-ethnic empire to run. So Attila's uh, charismatic, uh, fear-inspiring image is partly to keep these groups in line. His forces, meanwhile, carried on attacking the Eastern Roman Empire. Attila rampaged through Greece and Eastern Europe, killing Roman citizens without mercy, only halting his terrifying invasion in return for a large amount of Roman gold. He created so much devastation and fear that he was unopposed in the Eastern Roman Empire. Attila could now plan his attack on the West. In 450, Attila received an extraordinary offer from an unexpected source. Honoria, the sister of the Western Roman Emperor, uh, was caught out 
having an affair with the manager of her household. This was a very scandalous thing for an emperor's sister to do. And the emperor was very annoyed, uh, and he proposed to marry her off to uh, a nice, safe uh, minor politician. Uh, Noria did not fancy that idea. She wanted power of her own, and she is said to have contacted Attila and offered to marry him and sent him her ring as a pledge of her good faith. Here, apparently, was an imperial lady offering herself in marriage to him. I think Attila would have laughed his head off when this message arrived on the great Hungarian plain. Nothing in his subsequent actions suggests that he had any serious desire to go and marry Honoria and take over the Western Empire. Uh, even Attila's knowledge of European geography was sufficient to realize that uh, she was living not in Gaul, which is where he went next, but actually in Italy. So I don't think this was upmost in his mind. On the other hand, it's a terrific pretext. When you get married to someone, you expect the lady to bring a dowry with her. Attila demanded as Honoria's dowry a lot of the Western Roman Empire, just to start with. When this request was refused, uh, he uh, invaded the Roman Empire in the West in order to claim what was his due. With the excuse he needed, Attila unleashed the might of his combined barbarian armies into Western Europe. They were intent on wreaking havoc on a large scale. Passing through Cologne, the Huns encountered St. Ursula, the perpetual virgin. Attila was smitten by her great beauty. Putting his mission with Honoria to one side, he proposed marriage. She refused and a furious, rejected Attila had her killed, along with 11,000 of her pilgrim companions. He invades uh, into northern Gaul. One of the first cities he comes to is the city of Metz, uh, and we are told that he sacked Metz completely, killed everybody, left only the oratory of St. Stephen standing. By May 451, Attila's army had reached Orléans. Here, they encountered the superior Western Roman army at the Battle of Chalon. For the first time, the Huns were stopped in their tracks. This was one of the most decisive battles in world history. Had the Huns crushed the Romans, Europe may have fallen under barbarian control, and modern Europeans would have Asian-looking, Mongol features. Really what happens is that the Roman army fights Attila's forces to a standstill. And one little detail, which may or may not be re reliable, uh, is that Attila's forces are pushed back and they're fighting from a barricade made of their saddles. Um, so their horses are being killed in large numbers uh, and they're fighting ferociously. Uh, and then they're able to withdraw. The Hun casualties were so severe that rivers of blood were formed. And those thirsty from the fight had to drink water mingled with gore. The Battle of Chalon dented the image for the first time. And the sources report a massive crisis of confidence after the fighting on the first day. Attila is portrayed in his camp, putting up a big funeral pyre of saddles, and he's going to burn himself to death on top of them before trusted advisors persuade him that actually things weren't quite that dreadful. And there was no need to go to such ridiculous extremes. Uh, but it certainly represented a setback. Attila's reaction was to invade somewhere else. Uh, and uh, the following year, uh, none, no, no way deterred, uh, Attila uh, invades northern Italy. Attila tore into the heart of the Roman Empire. City by city fell. His reputation was so fierce that many refused to resist. They let the barbarians in, begging for mercy. Attila showed them none. I think this is partly a compensation for the failure in Gaul. He had to re-establish his position over the Huns um, by having a series of spectacular successes. It's to prove that the old magic is still alive, that Attila can conquer even in the heartland of the Roman, old Roman Empire, uh, Italy itself. And of course, these Italian cities are stuffed full of booty and fabulous treasure. And again, so both the, the fear 
and the greed angle on the two pillars on which the Hunnic Empire rests can be satisfied by a suitably victorious campaign in northern Italy. He terrorized his way across northern Europe until his army stood at the gates of Rome. The petrified Roman Emperor Valentinian sent a delegation to appeal for a truce, headed by Pope Leo I. This proved fortunate for Attila, as his army were riddled with disease and slowed down by plunder. He demanded gold and a safe passage home. Attila, I think by then, had a very weak position. Uh, his, if it is true that his army was suffering from disease, uh, and his base was threatened by the Eastern Roman Emperor. He had to withdraw backwards to Pannonia to safeguard that central base without which he could not function at all. Having been paid off, Attila was vexed at the breakout of peace. He returned to Pannonia laden with Roman gold and threatened to invade again as soon as he could. These threats were never realized as his reign of terror was soon to end. In 453 AD, at the age of 48, he took another young wife, Ildiko, a beautiful German noblewoman. The wedding was celebrated in the usual alcoholic style uh, that uh, Hans uh, enjoyed. In a drunken stupor, he flopped down on his back. He had a nose hemorrhage and the flow of blood went backwards uh, into his lungs and choked him. Uh, so when they broke in, they found uh, Attila dead and his young wife weeping beneath her veil. He was buried in a riverbed, sealed in three coffins, constructed from gold, silver, and iron. He was buried in secret, and those that interred him were then themselves killed, so that nobody would know where the grave was. In a sense, Attila never died at all. Attila the Hun only ruled his people for eight years, but the terror he brought to the population of fifth century Europe meant his name is synonymous with death and destruction to this day. The death, the funeral rites, the coffins, the, the unknown grave, uh, they're all part of the creation of the myth uh, of the great king, the lord of men, the lord of terror.